Early season dry fly fishing. One of the only things that gets me out of bed very early is a trip to the river. I'm up bright and early as the sun's rising to jump in the car on my trip down into Wales. When I arrive, <coughs> it's so early, there's still frost on the ground, so this is the end of March and there's still frost on the ground. So it gives you an idea of just how um, cold it has been overnight. A lot of the days have been warm, it's been really cold overnight. And I like to get myself properly organised, everything in its place, nice and compact. Drive is a tendency to rush before you hit the river, but if you get there plenty of time before anything happens, you can take your time and get it done right. If you're rushing about in the car, you end up with broken rods, <laughs> punctured waders, etc, etc. So you have to be real careful. I always make sure I've got something on the ground when I get changed. Just an extra layer between me and the gravel. Um, it just saves any damage to your waders. The neoprene soles and waders are quite fragile, so you have to be very careful. Same when you're kneeling down to put your boots on. You just have to be wary of what you're doing. Hence, I like to have that little bit of protection on the ground before I get changed. As you can see, I'm not in a hurry. Best not to be in a hurry. Take your time, get yourself organised for the day ahead. I think one of the things <coughs> that can be overemphasized as a fly fisherman, especially a river fly fisherman, is some of the amazing places that you get to see. Um, I'm down in Ask Valley and it's, it's pretty spectacular. It helps in the weather's nice mind and it's a beautiful, beautiful spring day. Really bright sunshine. We've had a previous four days of upwards of 15 degrees, sometimes as much as 18. And what I like to do is I always stop off at this little pool first see a little, it's massive. And what it does is it gives me an idea if there's anything on the water for last night, spinners. Um, if there's any fish taking spinners, you'll see them in flat down pools like this. So it's a good precursor just to check it. But the water, I know it's pretty much straight away, was unbelievably clear. So not only is it low, it's um, crystal clear, which can make things oh, tricky to say the least, that's for sure. I mean, that's maybe four or five feet deep. So, I finally made it down to the bank. What a day, it's really, really bright. Um, but what I've done, I've positioned myself in a river where I've got the trees, the sun's on this side of the river, in my face here, but the trees block it, so I can get quite a lot of fishing without worrying about the, the sunshine, which is really key when you're after these, these trout early on in the season. Um, the water's very low, it's very, very clear as well. Like, unbelievably clear. But I think once the hatch gets underway, I think we're definitely going to get them. Um, let me put this hat on, the sun's in my eyes. Oh, that's better. I can see now. But yeah, the sun's really, really bright and it's only I'm here like two hours early, it's half past nine now. I expect the hatch to happen around about 11, half 11, 12, and it's probably not going to last that long. Um, Eldos and March Brown is going to be what's on the menu, I would imagine. Um, 
I've seen a few fish rise in the slacks down there, but they're little fish. But it suggests that there's still something in the water, probably for last night, because it was so warm. And imagine there's still spinners um, somehow in the water, and that's what they're taking. But they're just tiny little fish, so it might just be midges, I don't know. So getting set up, um, I tend to have everything pretty much to hand. When it comes to landing nets, I quite like a soft mesh, and the reason for that is, I like other nets, don't get me wrong, but the reason for the soft mesh is it collapses in and around the fish, and it also doesn't drag in the river. So if you're netting a fish in fast water and you've got like a rubberized net, the current really pulls up, whereas a little mesh net is really good. And I've got that connected to myself, a little yarn, lanyard that connects to my, my wading belt. Um, and obviously a clip there that will attach to my, my vest pack. Because I'm kind of expecting fish in the half pound to two pound bracket. There is bigger fish. I had one here a couple of weeks ago that would have been nudging three. Um, but I think now that the season's underway and this bit of water's had a bit of pressure, there's a chance it'll look be, it might be a little bit more tricky. But my setup's a, a, a small nine foot four weight. My, a small reel as well, a really good drag. And what I've got is a very long taper leader. Before you actually see my fly line, I've got a very, very long taper leader. And then on the end of that taper leader, which is 12 foot, I'll put my tippet. That's usually six to eight feet. Um, I'll explain a little bit more of that in a second. But that gives you an idea. Low clear water, that pool tail, I don't want my fly line going over the top of fish. Um, and on my, my, my line here, I've just got a tiny little loop that I've created myself. It just transfers the energy a lot better. So nine foot four weight, nice and calm. I didn't need a stiff rod today because there's no wind. So, um, that's got to be my setup. My tippet, I'm not taking any chances. This is a 4.7 Superflex. Now the reason it's so thick is, early season you tend to get bigger fish. Now I know I mentioned that the fish have got to be a specific average size, nine times at 10 they will, but you've always got the chance of something big, so didn't skimp on this. And like I say, I've got my 12 foot taper there. I'm going to stick another six, eight foot on the end of that. I do not like um, being in a position, get my snips. I do not like being in a position where I can get caught out with a big fish. That's the last thing you want. It's getting snapped off on a big thing, so. At least attach this to my taper. Again, it's a very long leader, but in shallow water, it's just so much better fishing a longer leader. And this supple flex is really good because it's got a thin diameter. I've just attached that to the tippet ring at the end of my taper leader. Let me just get the fly on. Fly choice is simple. Um, I really deviate from a, a jingler at this time of year. Very, very rarely deviate from a jingler. I don't need to. I just it just works all the time. And the fly is good to look terrible, really. Um, they don't look great, but they catch fish and I've been using it for 20 plus years. The fly itself is actually older, believe it or not, than the Grimoire's Glory. So that gives you an idea of how effective this pattern is. Always moisten your nuts. Trim away any stub ends. And that's it, I'm ready. But I've got a few little bits of jiggery pokey that I like to do on my line. 
uh, my tippet and my fly, which we'll just talk about. But that's me pretty much ready to go. As you can see, a very, 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 very long leader. It's coming right into the um, the reel there. I've still got something to go. So about 18 feet. There's a little tip of the mm, There's the, the jingler. And a whole load of various olive patterns. Sedges are on the other side. But yeah, jinglers can't really go far wrong, mate. Give a wee closer look. It's a, a very simple fly, but as you can see, it's messy. I see a lot of jinglers and they tend to be really neat and tidy. <clears throat> this thing's got bulk, like proper bulk. Um, it's a big hook, it's a size 12, and I've got three or four tons of coke crackle in the back there before I put the partridge on, which gives it that leggy look. And in the water, it just sits perfect, and it's no wonder the fish takes it. It's, it can be anything, a dun, a cripple, um, something that's emerging, they'll take it for anything. So it tends to be my go-to early on in the season, every single time. So, the last thing that I do, the first thing that I do is I get some um, mud, and I get some mud on my leader. It's the first thing I do is get mud on my leader and I stick it on maybe a yard of the fly. So that's the first bit of preparation. And then I get some gink or floating, any kind of floating. I stick a little bit in the back of my hands. And then what I do is, rather than put it on my fly, I take the fly to the back of my hand and I'll do the tails first and then the, the top of the fly. <laughs> my final little bit of prep is muslin and I stick it on my fly line what it does is it allows me to keep my fly line floating high on the water but also it's really good when it comes to lifting off the water you're gonna get that ripper line it's very clean and tidy so it doesn't spook the fish which is key and that's my treatments I've seen three fish rising there's no hatch eyes yet so I think that's spinners for the night before but I'm just going to sit down, settle back, and um, watch the river, see if we can get a steady rise. If you start getting one or two fish rise, and just leave it, those fish will be small. Give it time, let the rise accumulate, and very soon the bigger fish will start to move. It's always a good idea to get yourself positioned <coughs> in an area of the river where you can see the top of the pool, the middle, and the bottom. Because all offer different things. I'm parked right in the middle here. To the top of the pool, a little bit faster water, poply water. This is where the fish will start off in the hodge, will be eating the nymphs. And you can nymph that, but I'm not here to nymph that. I'm here to fish dry fly. That'd be the bait. Spiders as well would work there. This is the main area for spiders. This is the middle of the pool. It's the main body of the pool if you want. Um, great for spiders and also very, very good for dries. However, the fish will be decent, but the bigger fish, for me certainly, I always tend to find these at the pool tails, the long slot glides like here. Um, you kind of get near them basically, and that's what they like, so this is the area that I'm looking for. It's all shallow flats at the pool tail, just before it runs into faster water. But yeah, get yourself positioned, obviously in a part of the river where you can see everything, top, middle, and bottom, and you'll be able to focus on all the areas, if you're moving up and down the river, you'll see everything if you're used to seeing fish. Um, so yeah, just keep your eyes peeled and make sure that you, you look over all the water, not just one particular area. Get yourself in a position in the pool where you can see everything. That's what I find anyway. Far, far better that way. So I've been here now for two hours and not a fin has stirred on the surface <laughs> and there's no flies coming off either and worse than that I've got a, a really quite chilly upstream wind. In the last 10 minutes, five minutes, there's been one or two flies coming off 
Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the water because it happens quite quick. You get a couple of fly coming off and then one fish will be up. And that's your precursor for everything going off. However, I'm just not seeing enough flies for the fish to make an effort. It's just like the odd one or two every couple of minutes. But to be fair, that's usually how it starts. You might see a couple behind me every now and again catching the sunlight. But there's nothing on the water. And that there's a couple of flies coming off. And you can see um, they're all getting blown upstream with this breeze. Doesn't help us, but there's quite a few fly coming off, drips and drabs, so fingers crossed it'll happen. Rather than casting out a fish, it's always better to gauge the distance by casting upstream so you're not spooking it before you actually deliver your cast. And always try and get as close to the fish as you can. Although I had seen a fish there, um, I got in the water basically stayed where I was, waiting for him to rise. I'm casting a little bit short here, um, just in the vein hope that this thing rises again. I know roughly where he is. He's a little bit further across the stream. I'm just gauging where my fly is going to land, etc. What the, the current's doing to make sure that I can deliver my fly appropriately in an area where the fish has got to take it first time. I don't want my fly skiing. So, if you see when my fly's got to land, I'm just watching for that fish. It's a little bit upstream of me and a little bit further over. I'm just keeping an eye, keeping an eye. The current's running from my right to my left. And obviously sometimes you have to put some aerial mends in just to compensate for that. But yeah, this thing doesn't look like it's going to rise again, unfortunately. Now, I've proper seen one. Um, quite far across the river, but I've seen it. And it looks like a really big fish. Really big fish. So I've just got to make my way over there ever so quietly, ever so gently, because the fish that did rise was absolutely massive. It was only up occasionally. I wouldn't say it was regular. But you want to get yourself in a position where you're not going to have to cast a million miles. I'm just looking here. Totally and utterly focused on one area of the water where I've seen that fish move. Just stop. Take your time. And just watch that water. I'm just peeling some line off ready in anticipation for them rising. But I'll stop speaking now. Just so that you can watch. Just patience. Patience is the key really when you're dry fly fishing, especially for a big fish like this. A lot of people would be a bit eager to start casting like a madman. That's not the thing to do. Just rain everything in, keep an eye on the water. And pray that it rises. He's just on the edge of the dark water. 
with the trees covering the sun, creating a bit of shadow, which is kind of what I expect, hence I picked this area. And the sun behind the trees, you get a lot longer fishing time. Keep watching. That's him. See him? I'll just zoom in on that so you can see. Keep watching. Tiny. But a very big fish. Very big. Close as a deer. Oh, missed it. Again, slow motion. I got lucky because the thing rises literally just in front of me. I knew exactly where he was. I was just waiting for him to give his cell away. And he did. And I got on it straight away. Unfortunately. That was a very big fish, really big. I have a little persevere there, but I, I clipped them ever so slightly. I clipped them, and that's enough. That's enough, unfortunately, when you're dealing with fish that size. Just to show you this again, because it's huge. Size of its head. I know it's bloody. You get an idea. Probably the best fish I'm ever likely to catch on the ask. <laughs> but there you go, it's done. I'm flailing away here, but I know that's it. Game over for me, unfortunately. Big fish like that, you only get one chance. Well. That was difficult to say the least. An upstream wind kind of ruined it. Um, there was flies coming off, but not a lot. And I seen maybe four fish. Four fish, that's it. Um, it's a long drive for four fish. Anyway, two I managed to get in the year, one I caught. Um, another two I managed to get in the year were big. Uh, one of them I put four different flies across, never looked at it. Another one, six different flies. Um, he eventually took one. But I missed it, jagged it and missed it. And that's it. Literally 10 minutes, 12 minutes. Just not happened today, unfortunately for me. So I'll stick a montage together of some big fish that I have caught in the LDOs. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you did, please subscribe to my channel. Take care. See you soon. Missed it.